Nina is a small live streamer looking to hit 10,000 followers. Having recently moved into a new apartment following a messy breakup, she's returning to streaming in earnest, but following a disastrous stream where her face is leaked, her life rapidly begins to spiral, with her receiving strange messages and later hearing tapping at her windows and footsteps inside of her apartment. As the game goes on, it becomes more and more apparent that Nina is the victim of a stalker, a hooded fan who can be seen following her everywhere, including the building she lives in. Things grow stranger still when both her building manager and the local policeman bring up stalking cases without her mentioning anything to them, and her ex-boyfriend makes a sudden reappearance in her life. Clearly there's more to all of this. I've just given you a brief overview of Chiller's Art 2023 game Parasocial, a uniquely modern horror that weaponizes modern concerns around cyberstalking, parasociality, and loneliness against the player. Chiller's Art are a Japanese developer who exploded onto the indie horror scene in 2018 and began churning out hits, with 2022's The Closing Shift getting mass coverage and generally favorable reviews. The studio likes to tell stories about ordinary people experiencing real horror, creating uniquely 21st century nightmares. When discussing Parasocial in an interview with Tokyo Weekender, one of the brothers that make up Chiller's Art, Yasuka Taira, said the following. I was inspired by a certain overseas live streamer who had experienced parasocial interactions. This might not be a familiar term in Japan, but it's something that can happen in the lives of contemporary people and is already happening. It's a kind of scary thing unique to this current day and age, something that was not so common a short time ago. We're in an era where people feel close to YouTubers and VTubers and anyone can start doing it easily. I think people are more familiar with live streamers compared to the past, and there are many more people who are both playing and watching live streaming, so I thought it would be interesting to make a game like this now, and I thought it would be easy to get into that kind of worldview. Here Tyra shows that he knows what he was doing with this game, attempting to dap into a contemporary concern and create a sense of horror that simply couldn't have existed in a pre-digital age. He's weaponizing modern concerns and turning them into a spooky game. Today, I'm going to be discussing the uniquely modern horror of Parasocial, breaking down this title scene by scene and discussing why it works so well. This video obviously contains spoilers, so go and play it before you watch this. It's really short, it's well worth your time, and it's pretty cheap. Like, go to Steam, type in Parasocial, you know what to do. If you enjoy this video, click all of the favorable engagement buttons. If you didn't enjoy it, click the unfavorable ones. Either way, it works for me. To everyone who's still waiting on that Little Hope video, I promise it'll be out soon, I've got slightly sidetracked. With all of that out of the way, let's start with some context. Okay, so here's some historical context into the game's themes and the meaning of its title. Parasocial is a term coined by US sociologists Donald Horton and R. Richard Wohl in 1956. Writing in Psychiatry Volume 19, they defined it as the following. One of the striking characteristics of the new mass media, radio, television, and the movies, is that they give the illusion of face-to-face -face relationship with the performer. We propose to call this seeming face-to-face -face relationship between spectator and performer a parasocial relationship. Though this concept has its roots in the mid-20th century, it has seen a resurgence in usage following the COVID-19 pandemic, a time wherein a large number of people turned to parasocial relationships in place of normal social ones? I, I'm not really sure what the term is there. This was an era where parasocial relationships reached an all-time high and were largely positive, preventing what would have otherwise been an extremely lonely period for many isolated people. However, as we moved beyond this era and began re-examining this era of parasociality, some have become bitter upon realizing that those they had formed these parasocial bonds with are perhaps not as genuine or real as they had expected. Writing in Human Arenas in her article Parasocial Interaction, the COVID-19 Quarantine and Digital Age Media, Caroline Laurent Jarzina argues, Online communities like Instagram and Twitter muddle issues of the realness of parasocialization targets and degree of personal interaction even more. After all, a friend in your online Instagram community might be a celebrity, a regular person who achieved celebrity through that community, or an actual friend or family member. Yet interaction with people in each of these categories is often largely the same, with famous actors sometimes posting messages and replies to their followers as if they really knew them. Though Jazina largely argues for the positives of parasocial interactions, quotes like this demonstrate the issue of authenticity, 
and how people may come to feel betrayed when their favorite parasocial target behaves in a way that the spectator views as outside of what they deem acceptable. In the instance of influencers, streamers, and other new media personalities, this is pronounced more so than traditional celebrities due to how online they are. The nature of their jobs allows for instant and constant interactions with fans, and an increasing dependency on parasocial relationships to flourish in a highly competitive space. In Parasocial, our protagonist Nina is a VTuber, a kind of streamer. VTubing has its roots in idol culture, an East Asian entertainment culture that started in Japan in the 1960s and has since expanded to become a multi-billion dollar multinational phenomenon. Idols, unlike traditional celebrities, are not really expected to be just one thing. They can be singers, dancers, actors, really whatever, but above all else, they themselves are a product. The job of an idol is to develop and then market a highly curated image of themselves to fans, and their continued success is seen as a win not just for them, but for the fans they foster highly parasocial relationships with. As a result of how invested fans are expected to be in the lives of their favourite idol, though the majority of idol fans are normal well-adjusted people, there's quite a few that develop unhealthy obsessions. In South Korea, the term saseng is used to describe obsessive fans who partake in behaviour such as stalking, and they are numerous enough that Korean managers estimate that the largest idols have around 500 to 1000 each, and on any given day could come into contact with at least 100 of them. This fear of parasocial relationships turning sour in idol slash fan relationships is explored in Satoshi Kon's 1997 masterpiece Perfect Blue, wherein the main character Mima attempts to break from her pre-existing idol image and draws the chagrin of upset parasocial fans, leading to a complete mental break. This film touches on themes that have only become more pronounced as this industry grows, with Parasocial being something of a spiritual successor to this movie, updating many of its themes for the digital age. Since this movie's release, stalking has only become a more prevalent phenomenon, with cases rising between 2020 and 21 in England in spite of the pandemic, aided in large part due to the internet. Writing in response to a Freedom of Information request in 2022, the London Metropolitan Police issued the following statement. Stalking has changed. In 2020-21, to 100% 1 of the 22,676 victims who contacted the National Stalking Helpline reported the presence of a cyber element by stalkers. Cyber stalking is no longer a niche crime or an emerging threat. It is what stalking is today. So, 100% is a crazy amount. This is an insane <laughs> realization. Yeah, pretty scary time to be someone who's online and in the public eye, or even not in the public eye. Internet, real scary. And with all of that said, let's talk about VTubers. <laughs> VTubing is a form of online idol culture wherein live streamers will adopt the persona of an avatar, usually anime inspired, and attempt to foster a community online through parasocial bonds, usually also playing games, watching movies, reacting to YouTube videos, or doing other streamer stuff to draw viewerships. They're kind of like live streamers, but they pretend to be anime people, and they sometimes come up with lore and backstories for their characters, so there's an element of roleplay involved in it. Started in 2016 with Kazuna AI, in only 8 years VTubing has become an industry worth billions of dollars and it's looking like it'll only keep growing, with talent agencies drawing new talent near constantly. Riku Tazumi, the founder of VTuber talent agency Niji Sanji, is Japan's youngest ever billionaire. Similar to idol culture, VTubers' growth and continued success is seen as a success for their parasocial fans, but there's the added element of anonymity, which can be seen as a barrier to the most obsessed fans who crave insights into the person behind the screen. Writing in Celebrity Studies earlier this year in an article entitled Waiting for a Face Reveal That Never Comes, How VTubers Challenge Our Understanding of Influencer Authenticity, Robin Schmeider notes, The alleged lack of realness of VTubers that makes them such an interesting group of influencers to study is best conceptualized as an act of masquerade. Rather than showing their own faces and bodies as to most other social media users, the individuals in question appear in the form of their highly individualized virtual avatars. However, as the virtual mask is seen as a mask that conceals something essential that needs to be uncovered, it is commonplace for audiences to not only ask for but expressly demand a so-called face reveal. Such reveals often take place in special videos and cause a surge in attention that manifests in high view counts. This communicated desire for unmasking hints at an underlying assumption concerning their authenticity. 
that to call an end to the masquerade would uncover a real self that is perceived as hidden behind the mask. Though Schmeider later comments on how the mask of the Avatar is not an obstruction to the ontologically true self, but rather a facet of the multiplicity of identity, this is not a sentiment shared by the most extreme VTuber fans, who will go as far as to do illegal things like doxing to force face reveals from their favourite VTubers. In 2023, the year Parasocial released, VTuber Isla Coleman had her name and address leaked by her fans issuing the following statement in regards to it. It's hard to process everything. It's even harder to accept the fact that the people behind this are Cole Knights, which is like a word for her fans, that I know and interact with in chat, Twitter posts, community games, and many more. I can't count how many times I cried during the investigation reading receipts. So, similar to idol culture, VTubers flourish in part due to parasocial relationships. Their careers are boosted and maintained by highly invested fans who celebrate the successes of their favourite, or Oshi, as they say in the community, as though they were their own. This is not strictly a negative. Parasocial relationships have been shown in numerous studies to be, on the whole, a positive, but when they become a replacement to socialising full stop, and the subject of them becomes the obsession of an unhinged individual, parasociality becomes a horrifying subject. With all of this context into this uniquely modern horror and how real and tangible it is, let's look at the game Parasocial and how it weaponizes all of this to create a pretty spooky game. Yeah, that was a lot of setup, I'm sorry, but it's all relevant. Nina is woken up by her alarm when her stream is due to start. We learn from her text messages that her friend Asuka is supporting her presently, providing food for her to eat. Her mother doesn't support her VTubing career, go figure, and she has her ex-boyfriend Rakia blocked, evidencing a messy breakup or him crossing boundaries following its ending, either way they're not on speaking terms anymore. Her house is full of boxes and it's clear she's recently moved in, likely a result of the breakup. I want to pause here and comment on the brilliant environmental design. Almost every room in Nina's apartment has a window, evoking a strong sense of scopophobia or paranoia about being watched in the player. This is only heightened through the game's masterful use of sound design, with knocking at the door and tapping on the windows being used to great effect. The only room to not have some kind of window is the toilet, which is the only room you are never required to enter over the course of a normal playthrough. The world is low poly, as is the case in all Chiller's art games, creating a sense of uncanniness. The world around Nina being this large, empty void filled with low poly houses and strange looking people. The exception to this is Semra Nina, her VTuber avatar, who is rendered in high definition on a poster on her wall. Semra Nina being so real in this unreal world may be visual shorthand for how Nina feels more real embodying this character than she is as herself, tying into some of the earlier discussed ideas around VTuber avatars as an extension of the self rather than a mask that is put up. She comments on this at the start of the stream, discussing how happy she is with the model and how it was definitely worth the money to get one that she feels so comfortable portraying. Her stream is a source of joy during a difficult time, and we're about to see this turned on its head. Prior to streaming, Nina eats some Nikujaga that has been left by Asuka. The food being left is a kindness that positions Asuka as a good friend who is looking after Nina during a very transformative period. Nikujaga is a Japanese adaptation of British stew, which is really funny. Um, Japan, try and make beans on toast better, I dare you. Nina begins her stream after eating and is playing Akamanto. Akamanto is a Japanese yokai or spirit who is said to haunt toilets, offering a choice between red or blue paper before killing the person on the toilet irrespective of their answer. There are many variations on this legend, including a game by Chiller's Art that this is probably a reference to. This game is full of self-referential humour, with the convenience store being mentioned at the end of this game, and Chiller's Cafe from the closing shift being a location that Nina can visit. However, I think this can be read as a more intentional reference, as Akamanto, the yokai, not the game, is known to attack people when they're vulnerable and in a comfortable place, so this may foreshadow Nina's upcoming tragedy. You can play this game for a while, getting not-so-helpful chat messages the entire time, this mini game where you play a game within a game and get live reactions from your chatters is pretty fun. But at some point Nina is going to lose. This game is completely unwinnable as its name suggests. So she requests a new game to play. She's offered the game in the form of a link from chatter I Love Nina. I Love Nina is a recurring chatter being the third to message the chat on the first stream and the first to message more than once. 
This gives the impression of them being a tad parasocial, and Nina seems to know them, at least enough to trust the link they send. So there's a degree of a bond here, as much as you can get between chatter and streamer. Opening a link live on stream is stupid, but Nina does comment that she knows the website. It's a sort of in-universe itch.io game distribution thing. So she clicks the link and finds herself downloading a game that's made specifically for her that says it will update every single stream. The first variant of this game is that you are in a big room full of trash and you have to solve a very simple puzzle. The game Nina plays updates every single night, each time drawing on new themes and exploring more of the mind of I Love Nina. The first room being this dilapidated dwelling that looks akin to a squat is likely a reference to this game's most subtle theme, class disparity. I'm going to come back to this later, but this game is one of the few Japanese titles I've ever seen address homelessness, poverty, and victimization of the poor by the wealthy. You can drop any more if you found them, because this is a rarity, <laughs> so I'd be interested to see more. Upon completion of a simple puzzle, Nina clears the stage only to find that her face is now revealed on stream. This is done in such a horrifying way, with the player likely focusing more on the game and the chat, seeing chat messages before you look at the other monitor and see that your face has been exposed. By the time you notice it's too late, there's a real sense of dread about it all. Nina was previously shown to take great pride in her career as Semra Nina, bragging about it to her mother and commenting on how great her avatar is, but now all of this has been taken away. The viewers who she once felt comfort in are now spectators who comment on her appearance, they invade her privacy. What was once a positive has instantly become a negative, tapping into the uniquely horrifying space that being a public figure is. Spectators can turn against you rapidly and you are now just a source of spectacle, something larger than yourself completely out of your own control. Nina ends the stream only to receive a text message from a strange unknown number demanding she continue play the games or bad things will happen. Shortly after the doorbell rings, and though there is nobody outside when the player looks, there is a letter in the post box that reads, I'm always watching over you. The viewership, once a source of pride for Nina, has been weaponized against her. And how quickly these things happened after the stream proved that this was not a spontaneous thing. I Love Nina has been planning this for a while, and he knows where Nina lives. Nina agrees to meet with Asuka the following day for coffee, and pulls a sleep running virus scan to her computer. The next morning, Nina is woken up by her alarm and sees that her computer has detected no viruses. She has to collect rubbish for trash collection day, which I hear is a big thing in Japan, and then heads out. Note here that both cushions are on the sofa. Moving out onto the balcony, you can see that somebody is moving in next door, and getting out of the elevator the first person you see is a mover who stares at you when the elevator door opens. This further drives home the eerie sense of being watched, the first person you see in this game stares uncomfortably at you through an open doorway, which sets a tone for things to come. At the bins, a strange man breathes very heavily and moves closer to you when you turn away, all while staring. This feeds the growing paranoia. Nina has been reduced to a spectacle, an object to be perceived and commented on more so than a human being. You're never sure who knows that you are Semra Nina, who is internally thinking, wow, that's a famous person. You know, there's always a sense that people are judging you, weighing you up in their heads. Also outside is a police officer who, completely unprompted, mentions that bad things may happen to a young lady like Nina living alone, serving to add to the growing sense of dread, though he also offers her some safety and says he'll hear her out should anything happen. Worth noting on the walk back is that Nina's apartment has a door that cannot be opened normally. You need to interact with a panel to get in, meaning that you likely need a key or to have someone buzz you in. If this is the case, then how did the stalker gain access to the property the night before? Best girl Asuka shows up shortly after and the two friends go to Chiller's Cafe, which is the set of the closing shift. This is another game about a stalker by this same developer. <laughs> they really like making this kind of story. There are several characters here you can interact with, and not all players have done this according to the Steam achievement data. One character you're likely to miss is the homeless man outside. You have to ignore the door right in front of you and go around the cafe to meet him. This brings me onto the point of homelessness in Japan and how this game discusses it. Japan has a relatively low homeless population officially, 
Official government numbers from 2023 say that there's only 3,065 homeless people in Japan. This number is likely incorrect for many reasons, the main one being that in order to reach this figure, various government officials just went to various parks and physically counted the number of homeless people. However, something that's important to note out of this likely wrong number is that 91% of men, men in Japan as men in pretty much the entire world are, are expected to be providers, and inability to provide is a source of shame. Japan has a very shame-based culture, so homeless men will take almost any work they can to get themselves off of the streets. Most of these homeless men are victims of economic uncertainty. Other factors that are more common over here, like drug usage or mental health issues, is lessened by Japan's very strict drug laws and healthcare provision. Japanese streets are an awful place to live. There's not really anywhere in the world where it's good to be homeless, but in Japan they absolutely love anti-homeless architecture. It's a feature of many of their largest cities. As such, homeless people who are victims of financial uncertainty, such as that seen in Japan's lost decade, turn to alternative lifestyles, with the Japanese cyber homelessness phenomenon being a relatively modern solution of sorts to homelessness. Here, homeless people, usually homeless men, as the majority of them are, live inside 24-hour establishments such as cyber cafes, earning only enough to sustain them living there through whatever part-time work they can get. These net cafe refugees must earn enough each day to pay for a night staying where they live, usually between $17 and $30, and so must remain in employment, even if their mode of making money is unpleasant, unsustainable, or unethical. The game will show more of this later, but even showing a homeless character in Japan is an acknowledgement of a social issue that is often not even mentioned in Japanese media. Japan has 22 million people working part-time jobs, and even though they aren't all homeless, for many of them, these low-paying and low-stability jobs are the only things keeping them off of the streets. This particular homeless man isn't relevant to the story, he just shows a willingness from Chiller's art to showcase the darker elements of Japanese society and engage in a discussion around it. When we unmask I Love Nina, this will all become relevant. Within the cafe, other themes of the game are shown front and center. The cafe sells VTuber-branded items, showcasing how image-dependent the industry is, further cementing how insidious invading Nina's privacy was, an attack to her brand and potential career trajectory for the sake of a fan's obsession. Loneliness and image issues are also explored within the cafe, with two friends who haven't seen each other for a long time meeting up, one chiding the other for not being her crush's ideal woman. We see two friends who have been pulled apart by the constraints of society, they don't see each other as much as they'd like, and when they do, they make fun of each other for not measuring up to standards that have been put upon them by external forces. A man sits alone, upset at the loss of what we assume to be a mentor, loneliness setting in around him as he doesn't know what to do with his life anymore. Also within is a mysterious hooded man who says nothing. When Nina sits with Asuka, the hooded man sits near them, watching Sam and Nina on his phone, hinting that he is at least a fan, but is likely I love Nina, or another similarly motivated stalker. He stands up and stares at Nina for a while, before taking her photo and exiting the cafe. Asuka walks Nina home, and Nina begins her second stream. Prior to streaming, players can notice a cushion within the apartment has been knocked from the sofa, showing that someone has been inside whilst you were away. This is strange, as the hooded man was at the cafe the entire time you were, he only leaves very shortly before you do, Maybe he drove over, but it's also likely that there's someone else in on it. In fact, the hooded man couldn't have got here before you because he waits outside for you and rushes after you to get in the elevator with you in one of the best scares in the game. The hooded man running into the elevator is one of the best scares in the game, and it's more audio mixing genius. There's no loud audio sting, no jump scare cue on a piano or a violin. There's only the heavy footfall of the stalker running behind you and his uncomfortable breathing as he stands next to you in the elevator. He's close enough to touch you, to hurt you, to do anything to you, but he doesn't. He just watches you, tying into the central themes of the game, being watched. That's the horror. Notably, her viewership has gone up overnight, likely a result of her face reveal, something that will probably be blowing up in drama channels around this time. Her chat has changed, it's no longer entirely positive, more fans ask if she's going to be showing her face tonight, they want more of her privacy being invaded. 
This shows that the genie cannot be put back in the bottle. The damage of this will be long lasting. A standard has been set, and now the fans expect her to meet it. Tonight, I Love Nina's game takes place on an empty street where Nina must rescue a woman in a white dress from a police officer and take her to a red door. The white of the woman's dress is symbolic of purity. Red doors have numerous meanings across cultures, but generally represent some form of sanctuary. So I Love Nina likely sees himself as the point of view character here. He's a traditional hero who can sweep away a pure maiden to safety and romance. There's a wall between them, something that might represent the mask of the VTuber or the constraints of Nina's life as a whole, things that need to be taken down or pulled down before he can take her away to this safe place. The villain, being a police officer, is likely to have been placed to subconsciously instill a fear of talking to the police in Nina, something that will come up later. During this stream, I Love Nina comments, I go to Chiller's Cafe too, an ominous message that means he was likely the hooded man, or the person the hooded man sent the photo to. Following this stream, Nina runs a bath and gets in it, as one does with baths. During this time, you hear someone enter the flat. Their footsteps are right outside the door, and you can even hear the shutter of a photo being taken. This is another use of the game's masterful control of sound design and fear of being watched. However, Nina interprets this as being potentially supernatural, showing a break in her psyche. She's willing to believe that there's a ghost haunting her or something like that, because that makes more sense and is actually probably a bit less scary than someone, a real tangible physical person, getting into your flat whilst you're taking a bath and taking a picture of you. Following this, the second day ends. Nina wakes up on the third day to find a conveniently timed note from Miyamoto, the building manager, who tells Nina to contact her if there are any problems. Nina believes that the prior day's happenings may have been paranormal in nature, so calls Miyamoto to ask if the apartment has been the source of any prior hauntings or accidents, looking to rationalize away what's happened to her as being some kind of haunting. Miyamoto says no, and then brings up stalking incidents unprompted, like without missing a beat, and tells Nina to contact her about anything to do with that, again setting herself up as a potential way out of what's happening to her, similar to what the policeman did. This perhaps shows that incidents are common in the area, but it's strange that her and the police officer have brought up these incidents completely unprompted in not at all relevant conversations. Nina then begins her stream and we play the game again. This time it's set in a convenience store. Maybe a reference to an upcoming Chiller's Art game may also be a hint to the upcoming part of Parasocial as at the end of this stream, Nina's gonna go to a convenience store. If it's the latter, this may show a degree of foresight on the part of the stalker. They know that Nina doesn't have any food in their house because they're able to get entrance to it. But this is a bit of a stretch. I doubt they've been poking around in the fridge and stealing food or even just poking around in the fridge in general as there's not too much to be gleaned from that. And as we see later, Nina doesn't need to go to the Combini. If the delivery man she called on Uha Eats isn't completely incompetent, then she could have just ordered food. So this is probably the biggest reach I'm going to make. Nina names the girl in the white dress Reiko, which can be translated as beautiful depending on the kanji, but I have absolutely no understanding of Japanese and I'm sure I'm gonna get told otherwise in the comment section. So correct me all you want, I'm really bad at languages. However, if Reiko is taken to mean beautiful, this further drives home the beauty and innocence that I Love Nina feels that this representation of Nina represents. It's also worth noting that Reiko doesn't have any eyes, showing that she's blind. Uh, again, maybe a reference to Nina, how I Love Nina views her as someone who isn't able to see what's going on, isn't able to make decisions for herself, needs to be guided by someone else. Speaking of I Love Nina, they leave another strange comment here asking if Nina enjoyed her bath yesterday, showing that it was him inside the house or the person the photo was sent to. The way he words these comments and questions, it's not like he's trying to scare Nina, it's more like he is legitimately trying to connect with her. He's finding common ground and asking her about her day. He is attempting to connect just in a way that crosses a lot of boundaries. During this stream, the television turns on, which startles Nina. 
As it turns out, the remote is behind the kitchen counter following this, so I Love Nina might be in the flat with you during this stream whilst he's leaving these comments. Following this stream, Nina realizes there's no food in her house, as there pretty much always is. Uh, this might be, as we said earlier, because the stalker has taken it whilst he was in her house to goad her to come outside. But we've already seen in this game that Nina is just terrible at life planning, so it's more than likely she just forgot to stock up her fridge. Here, you can order Uber Eats, which is an in-universe Uber Eats alternative, but the delivery man will forget your order entirely before talking about how he's a big fan, he knows you're the VTuber whose face got revealed, and then just wandering off. This shows how the spectacle has become larger than her and is overshadowing all elements of her personal life, and it also shows how someone who claims to be your biggest fan can just not care about you. He doesn't even bother to bring your order or correct it or refund it. He just walks off. So, no matter what you pick here, Nina has to go to the convenience store, narrowly avoiding being run over at a crossroads. So, let's talk about the convenience store, because it's a brilliant set piece, and I have a lot to say about it. The convenience store is where the uncanniness and unreality of the game is driven up to 10. There's the creepy sales clerk who stares at you no matter where you are in the store. There's the impossibly large woman shopping who seems to block you from going certain ways at certain points. The hooded man can be seen outside the entire time, and even though he never enters, every time the door opens there's a ring of a bell, meaning he could be in there with you at any time, and due to the maze-like setup of the aisles, you never know if he's in there with you. The player can put together their own personalised Tesco meal deal here, it's kind of a fun set piece, but you feel so on edge the entire time, especially because of just the really creepy, droning, lo-fi music and just how uncanny the entire thing feels. Eventually, after putting together your meal deal, you will be approached by Rakia, Nina's ex. Rakia himself is introduced as Hooded, making a clear visual parallel between him and the Hooded Man, and he clearly makes Nina uncomfortable. The first thing he does is ask her to please not run. He requests that she unblock him, wishing to share information about her friend Asuka, refusing to let her leave until she does what he wants. He sees her in obvious distress and withholds information from her until she gives him something he wants, unblocking him. Rikia is a person who clearly views their relationship as a transactional affair, him offering things if she capitulates to his demands. The cashier asks if everything is okay, clearly showing that Rikia is giving off bad vibes, and it's only the intervention of the salesman that allows Nina to leave, where she is then followed home by the stalker. The hooded man will follow Nina home and is unable to get in the elevator with her on the ground floor, so he runs up several flights of stairs and halts the elevator midway through in another horrifying jump scare, whereupon he just stands in the elevator with Nina again. This drives her over the edge and likely informs her upcoming mental break. Nina gets home and messages Asuka, who tells her to visit the police the following day. The unknown number who has been texting Nina over the course of the game makes some comments here which are really suspect. They make reference to her conversation with Rakia, basically just saying, ah, how do you know you can trust Asuka? Why don't you listen to Rakia? But how would he have heard that conversation? How does the stalker know the contents of a conversation we saw he was too far away to hear? Nevertheless, Nina messages and unblocks Rakia, who then sends her a picture of Asuka talking with the hooded man. Rakia also comments in this conversation that he is a fan of Semra Nina. He watches her streams. He says that her face reveal was all over the internet, and I've kind of been playing up how big of a deal that Semra Nina is in this video because she's under 10,000 followers. She's around the size of my channel. If I had my face leaked or something, it wouldn't be blowing up in the drama sphere. That, that wouldn't be a thing, because no one cares. So Rakia is actively searching out her streams, or at least knew about them, either during or prior to their relationship. Anyway, the photo isn't really that convincing, but Rakia does also make the point that only Asuka has access to the flat, which is true. So Nina blocks Asuka, and this is where the game gets really weird. So at this point, the game becomes a dream sequence, but there's no hard cut to it showing more of Nina's fractured psyche, where dream and reality are interchangeable. Because following her blocking of Asuka, Nina puts down her phone to find herself in a dream. Reality and dream blend together, it's one coherent, continuous gameplay segment. 
Here she is confronted by Semra Nina, her VTuber avatar that was once an extension of herself, now an entirely separate figure. This is similar to Perfect Blue, where in Mima, whose name I just now noticed is Nina but with two letters shifted one letter down the alphabet, sees her formal idol self as an externalised threat, something that was once her image taking on a life of its own beyond her. I believe the catalyst for this separation is loneliness, the blocking of Asuka seeing Nina lose faith in her only real tether to the real world, her only true non-parasocial relationship. This is shown when Semra Nina comments that now Nina is all alone, just like her. Loneliness is an ever-growing issue, and nowhere is this more pronounced than Japan. The hikikomori phenomenon, wherein people remain entirely secluded at home, is a national crisis, with Japanese charities taking measures such as hiring rental sisters to attempt to teach lonely men basic social skills and get them to leave the house. In blocking Asuka, Nina has set into motion the self-imposed isolation that, if left unchecked, can create a hikikomori. Suddenly, there's a knocking at the window. The stalker is outside. This is another really good dread-inducing piece of design. You have to walk through the house and find the window the stalker's at. You hear him knocking, and when you pull open the curtain, he rushes away. Looking at your phone, Nina realizes that there is now Twitch chat within her dream. That's the real nightmare here. But this does show how Nina views herself now, a spectacle who's always being watched, nothing more than the commodity to be speculated about by an uncaring audience. A potentially life-threatening, life-ending situation for her is entertainment for an audience who ultimately don't care. Her life-ending is just another form of entertainment. The stalker then enters her apartment. She finds a screwdriver and kills him, but shortly after the doorbell rings and she is stabbed by the person at the door, Asuka who now has dark, uncaring eyes. At this point, Nina cannot trust anyone, is paranoid about everything, and is about to enter the final day. Nina wakes up on the final day remembering that she needs to go and see the police. Even though she's blocked Asuka and tried to cut her out of her life, she still follows through on her advice. Outside of the police box, she is approached by the police officer who she met previously requests that they don't speak in the police box and instead in a nearby park, commenting that the box might make her feel uncomfortable. He later comments on the ineffectual nature of policing, telling her he can't do anything but give her his personal number so she can call him if anything else happens. The only way he can resolve this is extrajudicially. He also comments that the hacker and stalker are likely the same person, but this doesn't seem likely due to the fact that things in the apartment are moved around in earlier chapters whilst the stalker is in sight. Here, the ineffective or even malicious nature of the police implied in the games Nina has been playing is proven true. In previous games by Chiller's Art, the police are shown to be ineffective when it comes to stalking cases, so this is really just hammering home that Nina can't get out of this, at least not with police help. On the way home, Nina feels uncomfortable and can choose to unblock Asuka. If the player does this, Asuka will immediately forgive Nina and come over to comfort her, again showing how good of a friend she is. Asuka also comments here that she did not know the man she was photographed with, and he didn't say anything at all when they met briefly, so the photograph was likely staged. Asuka suggests Nina moving, and then, realizing her fridge is empty, as it always is, leaves to go to the convenience store and get food for the two of them, adopting the role of caregiver again in spite of Nina trying to discard her. Again, really good friend, best girl, for sure. Nina streams during this time, and in this game she walks down the street outside of her own house before walking in on herself streaming, revealing her location to the world. So not only has her face been revealed, so has her address. This happens a lot more frequently than you'd like to think. It is one of the worst possible invasions of privacy. During this stream, I Love Nina continues the strange comments, saying that she'll get fat if she only eats kombini foods. This ties into the earlier cafe discussion where a woman is concerned about her eating habits to fit the standards of a man. It also confirms that he was at the kombini, so he was probably the hooded man, just more confirmation of stuff we already know. And it may also show that he knows that Asuka is going to the kombini now. It may be a thinly veiled threat to something that might happen to Nina's friend. This is a really horrifying scene, as the player feels the sinking dread, they notice the entrance to their own flat, but you have to keep playing the game, in accordance with the demands of the stalker. 
As the camera rounds the corner to look at Nina at her desk, you can look over and see this is being filmed in real time. The stalker is in your apartment with you again. They leave quickly before a video of Nina in the bath begins to play on the computer and you end the stream. From here, you can call any of the other characters, the building manager, the policeman, Rakia or Asuka, and your choice impacts which of the two endings you get. So let's discuss both. Calling the building manager, policeman or Rakia will result in the same ending. The stalker will enter the flat, taking glee in this and messaging Nina the entire time with some of the most overtly horrifying dialogue, talking about how they're going to be together and counting down to his arrival, building tension. Similar to the opening game of Akamanto, this is unwinnable. Nina will eventually be found and caught before Rakia enters the building with the policeman or building manager and saves Nina. We get the following text on screen. I'm glad Rakia came. Afterwards, the police officer who consulted with me informed me that the stalker had been caught. That man was a fan of Sam Renina. As he watched my streams daily, I'm told he began to fall under the illusion that I was his girlfriend. The act of misconstruing your relationship with an online media personality and being under the illusion that you are in an intimate relationship is called parasocial. It seems there are many incidents like mine. He told me to stay cautious in the future. After the incident, I felt immensely indebted to Rikia for helping me out. I decided to go out with him again. So Rikia, much like the protagonist in the game Nina plays, has rescued the girl and now has everything he wants. This is until during a day, Asuka re-emerges, showing Nina photographic proof of Rikia collaborating with the stalker, calling everything into doubt. The game requests that the player try again. Calling Asuka will cause her phone to ring from the next door balcony, leading to Nina crossing the balconies to the next door flat, the one we saw someone moving into right at the start of the game. The person who moved in a few days prior is the stalker, with live video feeds of Nina's apartment and numerous photos of her up on the walls. He has captured Asuka and is keeping her in the bathtub, perhaps lending more credence to my earlier theory that the combini food comment left by I Love Nina is a thinly veiled threat. Here, Nina has to run away and go to the police before she can be caught. If you're captured in the apartment here, you'll see the resident is Rakia. He is the real stalker. Along the way to the police box, the building manager and the police officer will try and stop Nina. Talking with either of them will result in a game over, as will not being fast enough and getting caught by either of them. Reaching the police station, the game will then jump forward and show a news report from some time in the future, revealing that Rakia orchestrated everything. The building manager was his mother, explaining how he got access prior to moving in and was able to move in so quickly with knowledge of Nina's location, and the police officer was a fake played by Rakia's brother, that's why he didn't want to talk in the station and wanted to do everything extrajudicially. Kyowa Ashuku, the hooded man, was an unemployed individual hired by Rakia to orchestrate a situation that would benefit him. In this ending, Asuka and Nina remain close friends and share a meal together. Asuka teasing an upcoming Chiller's art game. So that's Parasocial. But here's why I wanted to talk about it. Rikia. Rikia is this video's title. He is the 21st century nightmare. There is so much uniquely modern evil in Rikia that I have to talk about him because I genuinely believe this guy is one of the most vile villains to ever grace my laptop. That's not really a saying, but let's roll with it. Like, we need to get the vile eye on it, the analyzing evil guy. This guy's the worst. I hate Rikia. Rikia is a sociopathic monster born entirely of ego. He weaponizes all of Nina's interests and safe spaces against her. He turns her against her friends and is willing to drive her to the point of insanity just so that she'll be with him again. He's willing to exploit an unemployed and presumably poverty-ridden man just to meet his own goals, with his Highland Kyoa being sent to prison being a very real possibility that he just doesn't seem to consider. If Nina went inside the police box and had stuff sorted, it would be Kyoa who takes the fall, not Rikia. He's willing to let other people take the fall for his actions. To understand Rikia, I want to first understand his relationships with other people. He likely developed an ego and sense of entitlement due to being coddled by his mother, who defends him and goes as far as helping him traumatize his ex in a scheme to get her back. 
His mother's obsession with him is shown when she has a meltdown at Nina in the game and asks if he really did anything so wrong as to warrant him being dumb. She's incapable of seeing any wrongdoing in her son and so assumes all of his shortcomings are the fault of other people. She blames Nina for his inability to be a good partner. Rakia is a businessman, so likely has full-time employment, which as we explained earlier is an envious position for many low-income Japanese people such as Kyoa, and this may inform a sense of superiority that leads to him being willing to let other people take the fall for him. Japanese men are expected to be providers after all, and he feels he should provide for Nina. This may explain why he attacks her career, a source of independence and income for her, something that takes away his role as a man. If she can provide for herself, then what good is he? This also may explain why he depicts her as blind through Reiko. He thinks she is blind to a reality only he can see. She doesn't see the world the way he sees it. And he views himself as better than everyone else, so she's blind to that as well. She doesn't understand how great he is, if only she could see. We already know that his family are enablers who allow him to partake in this kind of behaviour, but what about Kyoa? Rakia hires Kyoa, who I believe is either homeless or cyber homeless, as is evidenced through the first room in the game submitted being a kind of squat and the appearance of the homeless man earlier in the game. If all of the game levels are being recorded in real time by Kyoa, the only one that isn't explicitly somewhere that's tied to Nina is this squat. It's this very rundown abode. So Kyoa is at least poor, if not homeless. We also know this because the only concrete fact we get about him is that he doesn't have a job. The extent to which Kyoa is parasocial is debatable. He does watch Nina's stream in the cafe, but we don't know if this is an intimidation tactic or he is actually just a fan. We don't know if he or Rakia is I Love Nina, the parasocial chatter, but given that Rakia later admits that he watches the streams, I would believe that Rakia is in fact the parasocial fan and Kyoa is just a morally dubious unemployed man who's willing to take shady work. Kyoa is by no means innocent, but given the socioeconomic context as discussed earlier, there's reason to believe that Kyoa needed this money and was willing to do something reprehensible to survive. Kyoa is the only person without a stated motivation outside of money in the conspiracy, and he's the full guy if Rakia gets what he wants. There's no way to confirm this for sure, but I believe this interpretation adds to the evil of Rakia, who is willing to throw a man struggling with poverty, potentially in prison, just to get back at his ex an unambiguously evil act that speaks to how morally depraved and entitled he is, viewing others as objects of value rather than humans. This is also shown earlier in the game when Rakia likes to partake in transactional relationships. He's only willing to let Nina leave the Combini after she gives him something he wants. So there's two possible interpretations here. One is to assume that Rakia is I Love Nina, and then the earlier parasocial context, all that stuff we talked about right at the start of the video, applies to him. He's the stalker, he's the deranged fan, whatever you want to call him. This is interesting because he already had a relationship with Nina. But it could be that following him getting blocked, he started to watch the streams as a means of connecting with her, a real relationship becoming parasocial. This is why I Love Nina feels entitled to so much of her personal life and asks her such personal questions, whilst also revealing information about her. It's stuff he feels he's entitled to because he's her ex. Alternatively, Rakia is shown to be capable of finding people's locations online, so he may have been a viewer prior to even being Nina's boyfriend. We don't know how long they went out, we don't know how long he's been a chatter, and that would make his entire timeline a lot more sinister. Rakia is both a toxic ex and a parasocial stalker, two very real modern threats. The other assumption is that Kyoa is I Love Nina, and then he's a lonely parasocial fan under hard times who had his desire to learn more about Nina weaponized by Rakia, who we know to be a cunning opportunist who is willing to utilize others' emotions to benefit himself, a skill that probably serves him well in the world of business, but makes him a pretty morally reprehensible guy. Whoever I Love Nina is, Rakia is the clear villain. Even if it's Kyoa, Rakia is weaponizing that parasociality to serve his own ends. Another very uniquely modern evil that is embodied by Rakia is vindictive exes attacking the characters and careers of former partners. There's like a million examples you could give for this. I'm sure I'm going to get comments saying, oh yeah, it's just like so and so. It happens all the time. It's evidenced in things like the modern revenge uh, pornography phenomenon, as well as the fact that, forgive me for being political here, 
But the movement of Gamergate was spawned from the angry blog post of Zoe Quinn's ex-boyfriend. And that's still going on today. People are still mad about an angry ex's blog post. Rakia's actions are so insidious because there is a real precedent for how harmful they can be. He's more than willing to just go for the jugular on Nina's career. He wants to turn her into a spectacle and demolish her image purely out of bitterness because he was dumb. And you can dump people for really any reason, you don't need a reason for it. But Rakia probably deserved to be dumped, he's kind of an asshole. You can see that he just does not leave well enough alone, Nina has him blocked, that implies he just kept crossing boundaries even afterwards, they didn't end things amicably, and he still continues to cross personal boundaries. He doesn't let her leave the convenience store until she promises to unblock him. He only allows her to leave when an external force, the store owner, intervenes and he's willing to set up this convoluted situation just so that he can manipulate her into being with him again. He's a terrible boyfriend. He needs to work on himself, he needs to go to therapy or something, man. Rakia is a terrible ex in such a real way. I'm pretty sure most of us have had or know someone who has had a Rakia in their life. He's got all of the modern manipulative partner traits, he loves to gaslight people, <laughs> he's just terrible. Rakia sets up situations to lie to Nina and cut her off from her friends and support network all in service of her becoming entirely reliant on him. He feels he should be entitled to all of her time. There's likely some jealousy in him towards other chatters that leads to him attempting to end her streaming career, as Rakia would clearly like it if Nina was completely isolated outside of interactions with him. He preys on the loneliness of others and sells himself as the solution, something that, ironically, detractors may say about VTubers and idols. He's the most insidious part of both sides of a bad parasocial relationship. He's looking to utilize the loneliness of Nina and Kyoa to further make them buy into him, and simultaneously he's obsessive and privacy invading. He's kind of both sides of this. Rakia is so incredibly messed up in all manner of realistic ways. He doesn't have an evil scheme to take over the world, at least not one that we know of, but he does view himself as above others. He treats those that are poorer or worse off than himself as being lesser than him, and he uses techniques like gaslighting and doxing to isolate his partner who he feels entitled to. Not because they have any real connection, but because he covets her as something to be owned. Rakia views himself as above all others. He's willing to bend the truth to the point of traumatizing others purely to get his way. He's immensely individualistic, seemingly having no interest in anyone else, and his knowledge of the internet and societal fears allows him to manipulate others masterfully. He is the 21st century nightmare at the center of this game, a monster of the modern world. Asuka is the counterpoint to Rikia, and she's a solution to a lot of the game's issues. Sometimes just having a friend that's there for you can really help in these difficult situations, be it moving into a new place, not having your family support your career, breaking up with a toxic partner. Just having a friend can get you through a lot of those times. Asuka doesn't save Nina at any point in the game, Nina always saves herself, but it's Asuka's intervention that allows her to see sense. Just having a kind voice in your ear can sometimes point you in the right direction. Even in the bad ending, Asuka still finds Nina to tell her the truth. She's a good friend to her, even if Nina has wronged her. And this is not to say you should be completely spineless and stay in friendships where the other person just walks all over you, but it's to be understanding. I think that's the message of this game. Asuka is such a great character because she offsets all of the loneliness, all of the paranoia, all of the fear, just by listening, just by being present in the life of her friend. And I like how this game takes pains to not portray literally everyone as some weird parasocial fan. I Love Nina is the exception and not the rule, and whilst there are other chatters who do things like demand a face reveal, for the most part Nina's chat stays positive, they engage in her inside jokes, they're caring about her when she gets startled they ask if everything's okay, and it's okay to have some investment in the lives of your favourite streamer or your favourite idol or your favourite actor. It's normal. You shouldn't feel like you're some obsessed stalker just because you feel a lot of comfort watching the same person over and over again. It's completely normal. 
In fact, the only character in this game who can't engage positively with communities or friendship is Rakia because he's only ever thinking about himself. He's wanting to weaponize loneliness to serve himself. He wants to put thoughts in your head that shouldn't be there. This is what a lot of grifters or manipulators will do. And the solution, as is posited by this game, is just ignoring all of it and focusing instead on healthy interactions. Talking in communities of people who are interested in the same things as you. Catching up with your friends. Leaving the house and just engaging with people at a coffee shop. There's a whole world out there, and you don't only have to engage with the negative parts of it and only believe the negative things you're told. You can go out and see for yourself. You can shape your own lived experience, and I think it's good to surround yourself with positive people that can help you shape that lived experience. And I think that's why I enjoy Asuka so much, and I really like how this game does show the positive side of community. One final take on the duality between Rakia and Asuka is that they both represent potential ways a community can form. Rakia is a bad community. He only cares about the spectacle of the person he's viewing. He doesn't respect their privacy. He's happy to tear them down and turn against them as soon as it becomes beneficial to him. He cares more about the spectacle of what's going on with them than anything else. And his goals within that community is to further himself. He doesn't view it as like-minded people he can interface with, he views it as people he can weaponize against the creator to further his own position, like Kyoa. Meanwhile, Asuka is willing to listen, she's willing to be there for the person, but also, critically, she is willing to confront Nina with new information to prove Nina wrong. She's willing to challenge her. I don't think that a positive community is one that just entirely agrees with the creator all of the time. I think it's one like Asuka. You're willing to challenge if new information comes to light or if someone's got something wrong, but you're not doing it to attack them or tear them down. You're doing it because they're wrong and you want to prove them right in light of evidence that you can prove. So, yeah. Rikia bad, Asuka good, and that Y game great. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, please subscribe. I'm much like the hero of our story, Nina, in that we're aiming for 10,000, and I need the numbers so I can buy my VTuber model and start farming parasocial relationships. Whilst the analysis we do on the channel is all well and good, I long for the day where I can just watch other people's content and get paid for that instead, because I think it would be a lot easier. So the next three minutes of the video are just going to be yapping about the future of the channel and kind of where we're at with regards to everything. So you can go now, <laughs> it's completely fine. But just for anyone who cares, thank you for getting me to almost five figures in like four months, I think it's been. That's pretty rapid growth. I really wasn't expecting things to, to go this far, especially with the success of the videos covering Until Dawn the Quarry. I absolutely love the Supermassive games. As stated earlier, the next video is gonna be on Little Hope. I'm going to cover the full Dark Pictures anthology, I'm also going to cover the casting of Frank Stone when it comes out, but in between each of those videos I'm going to probably be doing some other stuff like this, just so that I don't get completely burnt out on the supermassive style of game. I feel like I need to cleanse my palette after each of them so that I can give fresh analysis on each of them rather than just saying, oh this one's like the last one, <laughs> and just getting really bored of them over the space of like a month. Um, as always, I'm open to suggestions. I'm working my way through a list that people have been asked for. Obviously, Man at Medan was the voted suggestion, and Little Hope will naturally come from that. I'm looking forward to doing House of Ashes, because that's been heavily requested. But I'd also like to go back and cover a few mangas or books or things like that, because that's where the channel really got started when I was talking about lovesickness, way back when. I say way back when, it was pretty recently. <laughs> but... Yeah, so stick around. I will get through everything that's been requested at some point, and thank you. For full transparency, I appreciate that the upload schedule over here is pretty terrible, because whilst I'd love to get a new video out every week, I have to balance this with my numerous other hobbies and my full-time job, so it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, I expect the next thing will be out in like two weeks if I can maintain a good pace on it. I've already got quite a bit of it written up. It's just about collecting all the footage, checking that everything I said was correct because I'm very frequently wrong. 
um, and trying to make it interesting and engaging for the entire runtime. Unlike this video where I've just added on three minutes at the end of just sort of chatting. <laughs> but hey, <laughs> you live and learn, eh? So for the final time, thank you for the continued support. If you've watched this far and you aren't subscribed, what's wrong with you? Click the button. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'll see you next time. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And however long it is until next time I upload. Bye.